Elon Musk has revolutionized the concept of space travel with his company SpaceX. And now, the billionaire has his sights set on colonizing Venus, in addition to his plans for Mars. The ambitious plan seeks to build a floating city high in the Venusian atmosphere. Let's take a closer look. At age 30, Elon Musk made his initial fortune by selling his two successful companies, Zip2, which he sold for $307 million in 1999, and PayPal, which eBay purchased for $1.5 billion in 2002. He decided his next major venture would be a privately funded space company, and SpaceX was born. Initially, Musk had the idea of sending a greenhouse, dubbed the Mars Oasis, to the Red Planet. His goal was to drum up public interest in exploration while also providing a scientific base on Mars. But the cost ended up being too high, and instead, he started a spaceflight company called Space Exploration Technologies Corporation, or SpaceX, now based in the Los Angeles suburb of Hawthorne, California. He spent a third of his reported fortune, at the time $100 million, to get SpaceX going. There was skepticism that he would be successful, which persisted into SpaceX's first years. After spending 18 months toiling privately on a spacecraft, SpaceX unveiled the craft in 2006 under the name Dragon. Musk was already an experienced businessman when he started SpaceX, and he strongly believed that more frequent and reliable launches would bring down the cost of exploration. So, he sought out a stable customer that could fund the early development of a rocket, NASA. His goal for SpaceX was to develop the first privately built liquid-fueled booster to make it into orbit, which he called the Falcon 1. The company experienced a steep learning curve on the road to orbit. It took four tries to get Falcon 1 flying successfully, with previous attempts derailed by problems such as fuel leaks and a rocket stage collision. But eventually, Falcon 1 made two successful flights on September 28, 2008 and July 14, 2009. The 2009 launch also placed the Malaysian Razak Sat satellite into orbit. In 2006, SpaceX received $278 million from NASA under the agency's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Demonstration Program, which was created to spur the development of systems that could transport cargo commercially to the ISS. The addition of a few more milestones eventually boosted the total contract value up to $396 million. SpaceX was selected for the program along with rocket plane Kistler, but RPK's contract was terminated with only partial payment after the company failed to meet the required milestones. Multiple companies participated in the COTS program in its early stages in funded or unfunded contracts. In 2008, NASA awarded two contracts for commercial resupply services. SpaceX received a contract for 12 flights, and Orbital Science Corporation received a contract for 8 flights. The workhorse rocket of the SpaceX fleet is the Falcon 9, and one of its features is reusability. Falcon 9 has much more cargo than Falcon 1, at around 28,991 pounds to low Earth orbit, compared to Falcon 1's capacity of 1,480 pounds. The first Falcon 9 booster landing took place on December 21, 2015, and SpaceX now strives to make its boosters retrievable as a matter of course. They generally land on a robotic drone ship near the launch pad. Many of the Falcon 9 boosters have been used multiple times to reduce launching costs. A more powerful rocket, known as Falcon Heavy, made its debut on February 6, 2018, meeting almost all of its major milestones. Falcon Heavy successfully flew to orbit, carrying a Tesla Roadster and a space-suited mannequin nicknamed Starman. SpaceX ran a live stream of the launch and the Roadster's first few hours in space, which attracted attention from all over the world. The two rocket boosters landed successfully near Kennedy Space Center, as expected, but the core stage hit the ocean at 300 miles per hour, which was too fast, and it didn't survive the impact. Falcon Heavy then performed an engine burn in space that is expected to bring the Roadster at least as far as Mars's orbit. April 2019 saw a setback for SpaceX when a test of the Crew to Dragon spacecraft, intended to bring NASA astronauts to space, experienced a malfunction while on the ground. This created a smoke plume visible for miles around Cape Canaveral, Florida. The incident set back the company's timeline for bringing people to the International Space Station. That said, the company has recovered and has been bringing people to orbit with few issues since the debut crewed mission in 2020. The next and most crucial milestone for SpaceX was space station delivery. 
Dragon, riding a Falcon 9 rocket, delivered its first cargo to the space station in May 2012 under a test flight for the COTS program. The launch was delayed for a few days because of an engine problem, but the rocket lifted off safely on the next try. Space flight observers commended SpaceX's ability to send a cargo spacecraft to the ISS. Private spaceflight hadn't even been considered when the space station was developed in the 1980s and 1990s. SpaceX fulfilled the first of its regular commercial flights to the space station in October 2012. That flight achieved most of its objectives, but it experienced a partial rocket failure during launch. The failure ended up stranding a satellite, Orbcom OG2, in an abnormally low orbit, which led to the mission's failure. A new version of Dragon's cargo variant began flying in December 2020 and has executed all five of its planned missions successfully to date. Venus, the second planet from the Sun, is the hottest and brightest planet in the solar system. This adds an extra challenge for SpaceX to attempt colonization. The scorching planet is named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty and is the only planet named after a female. Venus may have been named after the most beautiful deity of the Pantheon because it shone the brightest among the five planets known to ancient astronomers. In ancient times, Venus was often thought to be two different stars, the evening star and the morning star, that is, the ones that first appeared at sunset and sunrise. Observations of Venus in the space age show a very hellish environment. This makes Venus a very difficult planet to observe from up close because spacecraft do not survive long on its surface. Venus and Earth are often called twins because they are similar in size, mass, density, composition, and gravity. Venus is only a little bit smaller than our home planet, with a mass of about 80% of Earth's. While Venus shares many similarities to Earth, there are other characteristics where the two planets couldn't be more different. The interior of the planet is made up of a metallic iron core that's roughly 2,400 miles wide. Its rocky mantle is roughly 1,200 miles thick, while the crust seems to be mostly basalt. Additionally, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, making it impossible to sustain intelligent life. Although the planet is not the closest one to the Sun, it has a dense atmosphere that allows it to trap an incredible amount of heat. This is a more advanced version of the greenhouse effect that helps keep the Earth warm. Because of this, temperatures on Venus can reach 880 degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to melt lead. With its runaway climate change and roiling toxic atmosphere, Venus would be a pretty unpleasant place for humans to inhabit in its current state. Its atmosphere is dense with poisonous carbon dioxide and nitrogen and howling with 200 mile per hour winds. Its surface is a furnace with an average temperature of 864 degrees Fahrenheit. However, NASA may have a plan that just might work, and Musk seems interested in making it a reality. The idea, proposed by Alex Howe, an astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, is to construct vast, porous structures, rafts in essence, that, because they're less dense than the air underneath, would float above the most toxic layers of Venus's atmosphere. Howe's scheme is ambitious and costly to the point of absurdity. Even if it was green-lighted and funded, it might take 200 years from start to finish. However, scientists agree that, technically speaking, it is very much a possibility. The connected rafts, made up of hollow, linked sections the size of city blocks and together forming a flexible surface, would have to cover the entire planet. Powerful machines could begin to alter the air above into a mix that's breathable by people. Changing the hotter, more noxious, and windier air below the rafts would be a longer-term project. Once the top layer of air is breathable, people could live and work on top of the rafts. From there, scientists and engineers could closely study Venus and its hot, carbon dioxide and nitrogen atmosphere, perhaps probing its past to explain why a planet that was once a lot like Earth became a poisonous hellscape. But the main justification for building these cloud cities on Venus isn't for near-term science. If it was, remote and robotic probes would make much more sense. The interest lies primarily in the spirit of exploration. The Moon and Mars are likelier candidates to host humanity's first permanent off-world colonies. But as a new home for our species, Venus has a certain appeal. The planet near Earth-like surface gravity 
an atmosphere thick enough to provide robust protection from cosmic rays and UV radiation compared with Mars, and a shorter travel time from Earth are the leading reasons. Hal's Cloud Cities could start with robotic probes carrying solar-powered machines to Venus. The highly autonomous machines would suck in carbon dioxide and spit out oxygen and carbon. We'd store the oxygen for future use while using the carbon to build 300-foot-wide hollow tiles with enough empty space inside to make them very light. Indeed, light enough to float. The great thing about mining carbon from Venus's unbreathable atmosphere is that taking out all that carbon begins to change the chemical makeup of the air. It eventually becomes a mix of oxygen and nitrogen that people can breathe, starting with the lighter upper layer. Link those carbon tiles together and we could cover the entire planet at an altitude of 30 miles or so, high enough to get above the worst of the planet's brutal winds and heat. Here's the rub. Hal calculated that it would take 72 trillion tiles to complete the sprawling, floating planetary foundation, and we'd have to keep making new tiles to replace ones that break, most likely from wind shear, while also patching holes resulting from occasional asteroid impacts. And of course, the project wouldn't just end there. Once we've got our foundation tiles, we'd start adding layers until we've built up a continuous surface thousands of feet thick and remaining hollow. We can store all that extra oxygen, the byproduct of our carbon mining, inside the hollow ground, at least until it becomes a fire hazard. The first few colonists could immigrate from Earth to Venus before the thicker surface is complete. They'd live in enclosed domes where they could help oversee the ongoing construction. But let's imagine we've spent trillions of dollars and, after a century or so, built rafts 30 miles over the Venusian surface. We're still not even ready to send in the rest of the new colonists to Venus because they'd have nothing to drink. This is because water is very scarce on Venus and is the one major commodity we'd have to import from off-world. Sustaining cities, farms, and natural biomes on Venus could require a volume of water equal to a cube with sides 40 miles long. That's a lot of water, as in more than a quadrillion gallons. Hal proposed that, for starters, we strip mine ice from Ceres, a chilly dwarf planet in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. We'd build an enormous elevator on the surface of Ceres and slowly lift the bulky, heavy ice into space, where rockets, most likely built and fueled at nearby human outposts, would nudge it toward Venus. But Ceres would eventually run out of mineable ice. This is why scientists believe that Mars is a much better candidate for colonization. Despite appearances, Mars might be a fairly wet planet. The water that once formed oceans on Mars now lies underground at the North and South Poles, mostly in the form of ice, and will be enough to sustain a human colony on the Red Planet. If you like this video, you may also be interested in this one, which talks about something strange that is happening on the Moon right now. Do you think colonizing Venus is a good idea? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below.